with a bookmark in Revelation chapter 20. That is going to be our key uh, chapter that we just read in this morning. But turn to Psalm chapter 2, and let's get a little bit of context here about what we're going to talk about this morning. So we're back at the Clues and Milestones um, sermon series this morning, and we're going to look at a very specific um, event in end times prophecy. Look at Psalm chapter 2. If you open up your Bible in the middle, you'll more than likely be in the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 2. Look at verse number 1, where the Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Jesus saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill, Zion. I declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And look at verse number 8 here. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen. So this is God talking to his son. This is God the Father talking to Jesus Christ, saying, And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. One day Jesus will rule over the heathen, over the people of the earth. Look at verse number 9. Thou shalt break them with a, and this is really going to be the key of the sermon this morning, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. The title of the sermon this morning is the rod of iron, is the rod of iron. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse number 27. The Bible says a similar um, verse as to um, Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 9. It says in Revelation 2, 27, And he shall rule them, talking about Jesus, talking about Jesus' rule on the earth, he shall rule them with a what? A rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So that's a direct, you know, um, backup verse to Psalm chapter 2, 9, where the father is saying, I'm going to give thee the heathen. I'm going to give my son, you know, the, the earth and everyone on the earth to rule over. And Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. So in order to understand the rod of iron, that, and that's what I'm going to explain to you this morning. That is the goal of the sermon. And the reason that I titled the sermon, the rod of iron is because I'm going to explain to you why the rod of iron will be necessary. But before we understand why the rod of iron, and, and every time it says Jesus ruling, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. We're going to see other verses that say the same thing. We're talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the reign, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to explain to you this morning why he needs to rule and why he will rule with a rod of iron. He's saying, I don't know, that sounds like a very... You know, it sounds kind of tyrannical, right? Well, I'm going to explain to you that it's not tyrannical. It's the opposite of that. But first, we need to understand the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So we need to teach through that this morning. We're going to look at that, the details of that. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. And then I'm going to explain to you the purpose and the reason for not only just the millennial reign, but the rod of iron that will be used to rule the millennial reign. So we're in the Clues and Milestones sermon series. So we're looking at the millennial reign of Christ. So let's just do a quick review of end times prophecy. Okay, what's going to happen in the end times? We've already done many sermons on the end times. Many of the sermons that we've done have been events that happened before the millennial reign of Christ. So what's going to happen in the end times? In the end times. So we're in the last days. Let's, let's get our terminology um, correct. First of all, we're in the last days. Jesus even said we're in the last days. That's what I, what I mean by that. What I believe Jesus meant by that is the last half, the last half of time that this earth will be here. So Jesus said we're in the last days, but we're not in the end times. How will we know that we are in the end times? Well, there's going to be clues and there's going to be milestones. That's kind of the, the premise, the methodology of the sermon series. So certain things are clues, certain things are milestones, meaning clues, earthquakes, you know, signs in the earth, those are all clues. We can't really see an earthquake and be like, oh, we're in the end times. We can't really see a war and rumors of war and be like, oh, we're definitely in the end times. Those are clues that we need to watch for. Then there's milestones. 
right? So the milestone is going to be like this guy coming on the scene who is the Antichrist, all right? Look, there's been many Antichrist leaders. A leader in the world, as a matter of fact, you could probably argue that most leaders in the world throughout history have been Antichrist. But we're talking about the Antichrist. There's going to be one world leader that comes on the scene, and as Daniel 9:27 says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. So what, that one week is going to be this seven-year period. So there's going to be a world leader that comes on the scene. We're just reviewing the timeline here up to the millennial reign. He's going to come on the scene. He's going to make a covenant or a deal or a treaty with many. After this, we see Revelation chapter 6 and then Revelation chapter 13. That covenant with many turns into a one world government. And it turns into a one world government through what? Through war. Through a world war. You say, how, how is that possible? Look, we can see this happening today. We can see this happening today. There is a part of the world, probably 40% of the world, the countries in the world, are pushing for globalism, a one world system. And then you have 60% of the world. Look, if you're in America is right every single time on everything person, you're going to hate this sermon. Then you have 60% of the world that is like, no, we're a nation. No, we're a nation. These are nations like Russia, China, India, all these places. They're, they're rejecting this globalism. How are we all, all going to get together? How is the Antichrist going to get everybody together? It's going to be through war. That's how it's going to happen. It's going to be through a world war that that covenant with many will turn into a one world government. Now look, we can see it happening today. And I hate to break it to you folks, we're not on the right side. The West is not on the right side of this. If you just look at the Bible and who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, we're wrong on this today. So what do we see? We see the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many. There's going to be a world war, Revelation chapter 6. A large percentage of the world is going to be killed in that world war. But not everybody. But not everybody. Then we have this one world government, this one world religion, this one world system. Then we're going to have an abomination of desolation where the, the Antichrist is going to set up this image in the temple, the new temple that doesn't even exist now. So when they build the third temple, that's a milestone. Like, we're not going to miss that. Okay? And he's going to set up an image and he's going to demand that everyone in the world worship that image. This is the abomination of desolation. This is the mark of the beast. He's going to, he's going to make everyone take a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and say, you can't buy or sell. He's going to control your money, control your economy. You can't buy or sell. You're going to starve to death unless you worship this image and take this mark. Well, none of the Christians are going to take that mark. None of the Christians, the Bible says, are going to be fooled by that. Anyone who's saved is going to see what's happening, and they're not going to do it. So what happens? Matthew 24 details how, you know, the Antichrist is going to hunt down these people that don't do this. They don't conform. They don't go with the program. He's going to hunt them down, and there will be great tribulation, the Bible says in Matthew 24. You say, well, what do you mean great tribulation? It'll be worse than it's ever been in the history of the world. That's bad. That's bad because we can already look back in history and look at Christians that have been martyred throughout history by the, the, the Romans, first the Jews and Acts, then the Romans, and then the Catholic Church, and even Protestants have been, you know, had been killed Christians throughout history. And, and in horrible, bad ways. Millions of Christians. You're like, it's going to be worse than that? It will be worse than it's ever been. For a short time. For a short time. And, and, and the Bible says that if... If that time wasn't shortened, no one would survive. No one would survive. It's going to be so bad that nobody would survive. That's that great tribulation. Then what's going to happen? Then we have this great event of the rapture. You know, this is how Jesus shortens that time that Christians are in that great tribulation. He's going to come back. He's going to be in the clouds. It's not going to be a secret. This is important for both sermons this morning. Everyone's going to see it. Everyone is going to see Jesus Christ coming and gathering his elect together and taking them to heaven. And immediately after the rapture, within an hour, the, the wrath of God begins. So at the, be, at the center of the week, at the three and a half year period, the rapture happens. And then for another three and a half years, we have God pouring out his wrath on the earth. This is the trumpets and the vials in the book of Revelation. And then at the end of God's wrath, at the end of that three and a half year period, 
we have this great battle that we're going to look at a little bit in, in Revelation chapter 19 called the Battle of Armageddon. It's, it's, a, it's a literal battle where Jesus comes back, and we're going to look at it this morning, where Jesus comes back and destroys the people that have gathered together against him with the beast and the false prophet. Remember the unholy trinity. We have Satan, we have the Antichrist, and then we have the Antichrist false prophet. There's three of these people. Okay, there's three of these um, persons, as you would, you know, kind of the unholy trinity, as we look at, that are kind of leading this rebellion against God. Even in God's wrath, they're leading this rebellion, and many people are following them. Go back to, Rev are you in Revelation chapter 20? And then after Jesus comes back and destroys everybody in the battle of Armageddon, then we have this, this millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He's back, he's with us. We're going to look at the millennial reign, what's it like, who's there, and then we're going to look at the rod of iron this morning, all right? But that's the timeline of everything. So we're going to look at the millennial reign. Why is the rod of iron important in the millennial reign? Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 1. This is kind of the, the millennial reign chapter in Revelation. The Bible says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a chain in his hand. Now, the bottomless pit is hell. A bottomless pit is not the lake of fire at this point. Eventually, the lake of fire and hell will be, eventually hell will be in the lake of fire, which is in outer darkness somewhere. We don't know exactly where, you know, the lake of fire actually is. But hell is in the center of the earth, literally. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? This is the bottomless pit. So we see an angel comes and he has the key to hell, all right? And this is the angel in Revelation chapter 9 whose name was Apollyon or Abaddon. All right, this is the same angel. Look at Revelation chapter 2, or 20, and verse number 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old servant. So he lays hold on Satan. That's the dragon, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be filled, and then he must be loosed a little season. I'll explain that, why they're gonna let, you know, God's going to let him out for a little bit after the thousand years is up. But the first thing that happens before the millennial reign of Christ begins is Satan is grabbed and he is thrown into hell. All right? It's important to note that God has the keys to hell, that God created hell for Satan and his angels and people that are not saved. God created hell. Hell is not a place where it's not like Satan's apartment complex or something. It's not like Satan's home. You know, it's not like the porky pig you know, Satan and hell with the three forks or whatever. No, Satan was created, or, or hell was created for Satan. And he's going to be tormented there forever and ever, just like anybody else that goes there. So this whole idea that, oh, you know, I'd rather be, you know, uh, I want to go with my buddies in hell, and, you know, I'd rather be a ruler in hell than a servant. And, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the most ridiculous, stupid thing, it, it, unbiblical thing out there. Anybody that anybody knows that's in hell, that person that is in hell is screaming for them to get saved so they don't end up there. Nobody is ruling in hell. Who rules hell? God rules hell. God it has the angel that has the keys to let anybody in and out of hell. And nobody's getting out of hell. The Bible is very clear about that. This is a very specific situation with Satan. Look at verse number four. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. These are the people that came out of the great tribulation. And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So I'm going to get into the resurrections in just a few minutes. But first of all, the Bible here is saying in verse number four, that the saints, and I'll explain who the saints are in a few minutes as well, but they're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. They're going to come back with him to the battle of Armageddon. You'll see that we don't do much in the battle of Armageddon, but we are then going to stay on the earth and rule and reign with Jesus Christ. So it's important that you know this, because if you're saved this morning, if you're saved this morning, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted on him, you will be part of the first resurrection. Guaranteed. All right? Go to Isaiah chapter 11. So the first thing is, what is the millennial reign going to be like? 
We're going to look at what it's actually going to be like. The Bible tells us, you know, what, what's, it, what's the environment going to be like? And, and who is going to be there? Look at Isaiah chapter 11. You're going to keep your place in Revelation 20. We're going to keep going back there. But look at Isaiah chapter 11. The Bible gives us some details about what the millennial reign of Christ will be like. Look at Isaiah 11 and look at verse number 6. The Bible says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. Talking about a, a, a child playing around a, a, a poisonous snake's lair. Talking about all these animals that are just at odds with each other today, you know, they're not going to be at odds with each other anymore. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. What this is explaining here is that at least part of the curse from the fall of man is going to be lifted during the millennial reign. The, you remember, I mean, all the animals were vegetarians before Adam and Eve, you know, sinned in the garden. And that's when, you know, animals started to be killed. The first animals were killed by God to clothe Adam and Eve. Go to Isaiah chapter 65. I mean, today animals, they eat each other. They tear each other apart. They kill people. You know, there's shark attacks, all these different things. Animals are dangerous to each other and, you know, to people today. People are dangerous to animals. All of this um, is at odds with each other. That is going to go away in the millennial reign. Look at Isaiah chapter 65 and verse number 9. So part of the curse is going to be lifted during the millennial reign. It says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Look at verse 10. And there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people and it shall to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. You know what this is talking about here? During the millennial reign, there will be peace. Look, this is what the Antichrist is going to promise. This is what the Antichrist is going to come and say. You know, I mean, how many people have you heard today say, oh, we need, you know, world peace, and we just need everyone to compromise, and everyone just to get along, and everyone to stop believing their own religions and just kind of come together. This is how, this is the promise that the Antichrist is going to use, trying to get everybody to, you know, let go of all their, you know, moral convictions and come together, you know, for world peace. But Jesus is actually going to accomplish this. There is actually going to be, it says, you know, there will be no war, is what this is saying. Look at verse uh, number 19 of Isaiah chapter 65. He says, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Look at this. In verse 20, it says, there shall be no more thence an infant of days, meaning there's going to be no more, you know, children that die young, or nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die in hundred years old. You know what this is saying? This is saying people are going to once again live for hundreds of years. People are once again going to live just like people lived before the flood. But the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. There will be, look, people are still going to die during the millennium, but people are going to live much longer is what the Bible is telling us here. During the millennium, look at verse 21, people will live and die. And I'm going to explain to you, I'll explain that to you when I explain to you who's going to be in the millennium, but there's going to be people that live and die, but we're going to live much longer. This is another part of that curse of creation, um, of the fall of creation, the fall of mankind that is being lifted. Look at verse 21. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. Now, this is a really important set of verses here for the Americans. And this is, I'm really going to explain this in great detail towards the end, but if you're an American, you're living in America today, and you're wondering what's going on today, you're listening online, and you're a conservative, and you're just like, you know, freedom, and all this kind of stuff, you really need to read these verses 
in the Bible. So the Bible here is saying they will build houses, they will inhabit them. They will build houses, they will live in them. You know what they're saying? People are going to be, you know, working and living their lives. That, that's what this is explaining. They shall plant vineyards and they shall eat fruit of them. But verse 22 starts to get very specific here. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. You know what this is saying? This is saying to people, you will keep your labor. You will keep your home. You will keep your crops. You will go and you will, this kind of gives freedom a whole new, you know, whole new, this is talking, this is talking about freedom here. It's talking about you're not going to build something and have somebody take it from you. It reminds me of 1 Samuel chapter 8, where Samuel is trying to convince the people that want a king. The people don't want to be ruled by the judges. They don't want to be ruled by God. Like we want an earthly king. And you know what he says to them? I'm going to paraphrase this. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, he says, why do you want a king? The king, you know, the, the type of king that you're going to have, because you're going to have a man for a king, not Jesus Christ. You're going to have a man for a king. You know what he's going to do? He's going to take your sons away. Why? For war. Samuel says, he's going to take a tenth of your crops. He's going to take, go check your taxes here and tell me if it was the tenth. He's going to take a tenth of this and a tenth of that. You know what he's saying? You're going to build houses and somebody else is going to live in them. He's saying it would be better if the Lord, it would be better if you just kept the Lord as your leader. Because you would be more, and I don't want to give the answer away this morning, but you would be free. Instead, what do we do today? We build houses and other people inhabit them. They take our money from us and they build houses for people that, they, they take our labor. That man standing on the corner, that 30 year old man with two arms and two legs, standing there asking you for money and saying, I don't want to spend my labor, I want yours. It's exactly what he's saying. But people don't know the Bible today. So they're like, oh, poor guy. He's saying, I don't want to spend mine. I want yours. It's not going to happen in the millennial reign. There's going to be prosperity in the millennial reign. You're going to keep your own property. You're going to keep your own labor. No more welfare state in the millennial reign. They shall not labor in vain, verse 23, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. And the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox, like a bullock, sorry, like the bullock. And shall be, like, and shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, saith the Lord. There's going to be complete peace even in the, the natural world, there's going to be peace, even amongst the animals. Look, the Bible is describing paradise here. The Bible is describing a perfect society here. And that is what is going to be accomplished. So the question is, who will be there? Is it just us? Turn to Revelation chapter 19. In order to understand who will be in the millennial reign of Christ and who will be experiencing this wonderful time of this thousand year reign, we need to understand who is going to be there. What groups of people? In order to understand who's going to be there, we kind of need to see what has happened at the run up to the millennial reign of Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 19. There's going to be two groups of people there, two main groups. Look at Revelation chapter 19. So at the end of the wrath of God, you say, the wrath of God has been going on for three and a half years. And as we study, we'll do another sermon on the wrath of God. But it's, it's extreme. It's extreme. I mean, the earth is, is punished for what they've done. And there's still people that are resisting the Lord Jesus Christ at this point. Look at verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19. I saw heaven open. This is at the end of the wrath of God. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Let's see if we can figure out who this is. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. This is, you know, here's your, here's your portrait of long-haired Jesus wearing a dress right here. All right? His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
and his clo he was clothed with a vesture, meaning a garment, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. There's your answer right there. This is the Lord Jesus Christ right here. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These are the saved people that are in heaven. And out of his mouth groweth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with what? Here it is again, a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men. Either all the people that gathered together for war at Armageddon, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So Jesus comes back and he basically, all those that fought against the Lord show up to, you know, this battle. And it's not a fight. Jesus just destroys everyone. No one has to fight except Jesus. And these are the people, though, that bird up against God's wrath. These are the people that, as God was pouring out his wrath, just hated Jesus Christ. They knew he was there. They saw him come back in the clouds and get his, his saved saints three and a half years earlier, but they just burned up against him. And look, like a third of the people on the earth are killed in the wrath of God. It is a bloody three and a half years. And many people, I am sure, we're going to talk about tonight, will get saved during the wrath of God. I think many people will get saved after the rapture, after they... they they experience that. They see Jesus Christ come back. They're going to be like, oh, we were wrong. And people are going to believe on him at that point. But not everybody is going to burn up against. Not everybody hates Jesus Christ. So you've got a lot of people that didn't show up to this battle. you got a lot of people that didn't show up to the battle of Armageddon to fight the Lord Jesus Christ. So after this battle is over, there's still a lot of people left on the earth. There's still a lot of people left on the earth that are saved and unsaved. Because look, not everybody that's unsaved, folks, when we knock on somebody's door and ask them if they want to know how to get to heaven, if they want to hear the gospel, not everybody that says no is a reprobate that hates the Lord. Many people are just, they don't really care, or they're just, they don't really understand the, the situation that they're in. They don't really understand the wrath of God that abideth on them being unsaved. They're just wrapped up in the, in, the, in the concerns of this world. It doesn't mean they hate the Lord. There are people that do hate the Lord, and they're the people at this battle. And they're the ones that Jesus Christ is going to take care of. So going into the millennial reign, there's two groups of people. There's these people that are saved and unsaved people on the earth. And then there's the saints that come back with Jesus that were part of that first resurrection that come back with Jesus to rule and reign with him. Now, these saints, they're in their glorified bodies. These saints will never die. The people that are part of the first resurrection will never die. So you literally have, you know, these people that are mortal and these people that will never die during the millennial reign. And the people that will never die, you know, are, are the ones that are going to be in charge. And Jesus Christ says, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 13. Jesus Christ says many times throughout his ministry, if you remember the parable of the talents, where Jesus says, you know, the person that went out and turned five talents into ten talents, Jesus says, you know, because, you know, you're a good and faithful servant, you will be over ten cities. This is talking about, you know, the rewards that Jesus is going to give, you know, the believers in the millennial reign of Christ. Meaning, if you did good in your life, look, the good that we do in our lives as saved believers has nothing to do with whether we not whether or not we go to heaven, but it does have to do with the rewards that we get when we go to heaven. Right. So, you know, some people are going to be in charge of cities. Some people are going to be in charge of, you know, maybe just, you just watch that guy. <laughs> like if they did nothing in their life as a Christian, they're like, okay, we got this, you know, here, why don't you just watch this lamppost for us for the thousand years or whatever, right? There's probably going to be a lot of people like that. We're like, okay, you know, you just, uh, 
the, the wind sometimes blows that tree pretty hard. You just keep an eye on that tree. All right? So there's going to be a lot of people like that. But the Lord is saying that good and faithful servants during their life who are saved are going to rule over cities. You know, they're going to rule. The, the better you do in your life as a believer, you know, look, this is, this is kind of a self-focused way to think of a Christian. I try not to think of the rewards in heaven. I'm still pretty excited that I'm saved. I'm pretty excited. And I'm not going to hell. I'm just trying to do everything I can in my life for the Lord Jesus Christ that saved me. But there will be rewards. And you will be rewarded according to how you did in this life. All right? Think of it as an investment. You know, what you're doing today is going to reverberate through your eternity. Think about it that way. But the point is, many did not come to the fight of the Battle of Armageddon. There's two groups of people. There's the saved and unsaved people that are still on the earth. And there's people that are born. There's people that are born and die in the millennial reign. There's people, you know, just regular mortal people, and then there's the glorified saints that are ruling with Jesus Christ. Those are the two distinct groups. Now, is it every saint that comes back with Jesus Christ? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of weird teaching out there, like, you know, Baptist writers and all these different people that try to separate out, you know, different groups of Christians that, oh, only these, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses are the weirdest cult that, that separates out, you know, weird people. We're going to talk about that tonight. Thessalonians chapter 13. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, to, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, with all his saints. So anybody that has been raptured, anybody that was part of the first resurrection is going to come back with Jesus Christ and rule and reign with him a thousand years. All right, look at verse, um, go to 1 Corinthians. You know, I mean, and then all Christians are saints, you know, and I don't really have time to preach. Let's go to one verse on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 2. I mean, that's really a different sermon. There's a lot of weird teaching on saints, too, a lot of false doctrine on saints, you know, like that the saints are only who some church decides is a saint. No, if you, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved, you're a saint. It's very clear in the Bible. All right, so I'm looking at a bunch of saints here. This morning. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are what? That are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be what? Saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So the people that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is equated with they are what a, that's what a saint is. Somebody that is saved is a saint. Go back to Revelation chapter 19. Go back to Revelation chapter 19. So we see that the Christians come back. They've already been resurrected um, at the rapture. They've been given those glorified bodies. You know, 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 15 is kind of that resurrection chapter. Um, we'll look at that in just a few minutes. But, you know, our, at, at the rapture, our, incorru our corruptible bodies, our corruptible flesh will be raised in incorruptible. So this flesh that we have that is, we won't have that anymore. We won't have that going into the millennial reign. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse number 20. After this battle, it says, The beast was taken, this is the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the and them that worshipped his image. That's that abomination of desolation in Revelation 13. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Like I said, we're not going to do anything. If Jesus is just going to slay everybody, which the sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. So in verse number 20, it says, the Antichrist at this point and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, nobody's in the lake of fire at this point. That's in outer darkness. Nobody's in the lake of fire. All right? Eventually, death and hell in Revelation 20, 20 are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and then everyone that was in hell will be in the lake of fire. But right now, they're like the first people at the lake of fire hotel right here. And the reason that God throws them in the lake of fire, instead of putting them in hell, is because he's done with them. They're not coming back. He's going to use Satan, you know, he's going to pull Satan out of the bottomless pit after the thousand-year reign, and he's going to use him for a specific purpose. And I'll explain that. Um, in just a few minutes, go back to Revelation chapter 20. But after this battle, he's done with the Antichrist. He's done with the false prophet. They're in the lake of fire, and they're there for eternity. Look at verse number 5 of Revelation chapter 20. And the Bible says, during the millennial reign, during the millennial reign, it says, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. 
this is the first resurrection. So the people that come back with Jesus are part of the first resurrection. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and let's just review this real quick. So the people that die, even the saved people that die during the millennial reign, they are not part of the first resurrection. Okay, they are not resurrected in the first resurrection. Just because they got saved during the wrath or maybe the millennial reign, it, it doesn't mean that they just become part of that first resurrection. That's over. That's past. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and look at verse number 20. This is kind of the resurrection chapter in the Bible. This kind of gives the order of the resurrection of the saints. Look at verse 20 in Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So the first person that was resurrected, the first fruits is Jesus Christ. For since by man came death, and by, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ that all shall be made alive. All that's saying is that because death entered the world when Adam and Eve sinned against God, there, there became a necessity for a resurrection from the dead. Okay? And as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall be all made alive. So Christ is kind of the inverse of Adam here is what it's saying. Is that while Adam brought death into the world, Jesus Christ brings life into the world. Look at verse 23. But, now this is the key that we need to understand for Revelation chapter 20, but every man in his own order, all right? Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That's the rapture. So we see that Christ was resurrected first, and then we have what we call the first resurrection at the rapture where we all are part of that first resurrection. That's, and that's, look, that's anybody that's lived and died up to that point and is saved. So it's not just the people that are alive at the rapture, and I've preached through this before, but it's any person that has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and has died up to that point in history. All the people from the graves will be resurrected and given un, un, incorruptible bodies, and they will be in these glorified states, and Jesus will take them to heaven with him. Then, look at this in verse 24, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. That's where he just destroyed everybody at the Battle of Armageddon. And look at verse 25, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And then the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So death isn't destroyed yet during the millennial reign. Right? So the Bible is saying that Jesus, when he comes here and starts ruling in the millennial reign, he's going to put down all of his enemies. You're starting to see the need for the rod of iron. There's going to be saved people and unsaved people in the millennial reign. And there's a battle to get to the millennial reign, and then those unsaved people are still going to be there. People are still going to be born. They're still going to be you know, living their lives. They're going to be born and die. And then at the end of the millennial reign, we will have that second resurrection. That second resurrection. That second resurrection is at the same time as the great white throne judgment at the end of Revelation chapter 20 where, you know, death and hell are delivered up and they're judged by what? All the people in hell at that point are going to be brought before God and they're going to get what they always wanted. They're going to be judged by their works. All those people that could not trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, but trusted in their own works. What do we see today? Anybody that is not saved, that believes in heaven, thinks they're getting there by their own works. Yeah. I don't care if you're Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, Catholic, whatever you are, it's all based on their works. If I pray, if I go to church, if I do these things, I will get to heaven. That's what they all believe. They have to, in order to be saved, you have to take that trust off yourself and put it only on Jesus. It's 100% or nothing. Amen. And that is salvation. But the people that couldn't do that are going to stand before that great white throne. They're going to get what they wanted. They're going to be judged by their works. And they're all going to be thrown back in hell, and hell's going to be put in the lake of fire. Because your works will never get you there. The logic of it is that your works can't cover up your, your good works. You're the greatest person ever. They can't cover up, cover up your sins. Doesn't matter how nice I am if I stole the car. The car. Doesn't matter how how many people like me. If I committed a crime, I have to pay for it. And God's a perfect judge, and He has to punish people for their sins. He's the He's the perfect judge in righteousness. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed 
is death. And that's the end of the millennium. There will be more, no more death after that great white throne judgment. Go back to Revelation 20 and look at verse number 7. So before the millennium ends and before the great white throne judgment, I kind of just, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit there. But before the, the earthly reign of Christ is over, something interesting happens. Jesus Christ lets Satan out. You're like, what in the world? Why would you let him out? He lets the, the, the rabid dog out of the cage. Look at verse 7. It says, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Why? Look what he does, though. And he shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So as, I mean, this is so interesting here, because as Jesus is reigning and ruling in this perfect way, in this perfect prosperity on the earth, the Bible here is explaining that there's a lot of people that were not going along with it. There's a lot of people that did not like the king. There's a lot of people that actually hated the king. And God is going to use Satan to gather them up. He's going to use Satan to round them all up, to be the herder of all these people that hate him. And he's going to go out, and he's going to find these people that hate Jesus Christ, and he's going to say, you know, I don't know what he's going to say, but he's probably going to be like, hey, you can get yourself to heaven, kind of like what he says today. And he's going to say, let's go kill the king. Let's go to battle. Jesus is simply drawing a line here and seeing who is with him and who is against him. That's what, it, it's brilliant, really. Jesus just wants to know at this point, at the end of the millennial reign, who's with me and who's against me. And he's looking for who crosses that line. Look, the worst type of people are, are the people that like you don't really know. Or the people that you think are with you and they're not really with you. Jesus is just kind of cutting through all that, you know, all that blurry vision right there. So he lets Satan out Satan goes and gathers up all these people that hate Jesus. And look at verse number 9. And they went up upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Again, we don't really have to do anything. That's the battle of Gog and Magog. A lot of people, you know, Gog and Magog, the area is like in Russia or around that area. And a lot of people... A lot of false prophets are like something goes on with Russia and they're like, Gog and Magog. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's after the millennial reign. It's after, you see how important it is to understand the Bible? These things, I mean, these are sort of complicated, but they're not impossible to understand. We can, once we get the timelines right, who's what, who's where, it's kind of clear on why these things are happening and when these things are going to happen. All right, so we see that's the millennial reign. After the millennial reign is the great white throne, and then that second re resurrection, and then, you know, the last enemy that's destroyed is death, of course. But go to back to, um, or just look at the front of your bulletin, where the Bible says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter there shall be broken to shivers. So now the question I want to answer for you as we um, conclude this, this morning is, why the millennial reign? Why, why is Jesus going to do this? Why the millennial reign? And then further, a further question, a follow-up on that, why the rod of iron? All right? And that's what I want to answer for you now, because Jesus is very clearly going to rule with a rod of iron. You just kept hearing that again and again. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. The reason for the millennial reign is, is, is a simple one, is that Jesus, throughout the Bible, if you've read the Bible and you've read it multiple times, you realize that God is telling us how to do it. He is telling us, not only to how to live as individuals. Look, he's telling us how to be saved. But then he's telling us how to, how to prosecute our lives. He's telling us how to raise our children. He's telling us how to act as a nation. He's telling us how to do it, and we don't listen. He's telling the nation of Israel as the, as the greatest example. Not only the nation of Israel, though. All the nations around, Moab and Edom and Egypt and all the other nations and Babylon, they all get judged because none of them listen. So he's telling us how to do it and how to avoid all this judgment, and we don't listen. So why the millennial reign? Because he's going to show us how it's done. He's going to show us how to rule. After 
thousands of years on this earth, Jesus Christ, after watching us mess it up again and again and again, and having him pour out his judgment, his judgment, his judgment, his judgment, and finally just having God pour out his wrath on the earth, he's just going like, to come back and he's just going to show us. He's like, no, it was like this. He's going to show us how it's done. And he's going to use a rod of iron. But look, during the millennial reign, folks, you say rod of iron, that sounds bad. You're going to have freedom. You're going to have prosperity. You're going to have peace on earth. You're going to have private property. You're going to have all these rights with a rod of iron. You say, what, what am I... What am I missing? See, folks, what you need to understand, and it, it may be hard for an American to understand this. This, what I'm explaining to you, is the perfect government. Jesus is going to show us what the perfect government is. When Jesus in, is in charge, he's going to show us what the perfect government is. It, 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 is a, it is a monarchy with a righteous king and people and righteous people that are helping rule. That's a perfect government. You're like, but the U.S. is the perfect government. But, you know, America. I mean, first of all, like, what? Look around. I mean, I mean, look around. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people in America today. And I'm going to speak specifically about America. There's a lot of people in America today that recognize the problems. They see all these things, and if they have a conscience that's even partially intact, they're like, that's wrong. This is messed up. This is crazy. That's perversion. They see this stuff, and they know it's wrong, but they have no clue how we got here, and they have no clue how to fix it. Right. And that's how to escape it. I've said this many times. I said it again on Friday night at men's preaching night, but this country was lost from the pulpit. Not from the government. It was lost because the man of God stopped yelling the word of God. And the people stopped believing the word of God. And it will only be fixed. It will only be won back with the word of God. That's the only way. So people, they recognize the problems, but they have no idea. They're like, oh, no, we need a second enlightenment. Look, folks, the Enlightenment, and this is a sermon by itself, and I will preach a sermon on the Enlightenment one day, but let me just give you a little bit of a taste. The Enlightenment, which had influence on the foundation of our country. Not everybody was on board with it, but it had influence with a lot of the people that founded the country. The Enlightenment was anti-Christ. Let me just, I'm going to give you one example of why it was anti-Christ. The Enlightenment deserves no credit for the prosperity that the United States had. And I'm going to explain, I'm going to, I'll just give you one example. But one of the main principles of the Enlightenment was this idea of deism. You say, deism, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that uh, certain founding fathers were deists, that they weren't Christians, they were deists. But I guess, you know, they believed in God, so it's, it's still pretty good. Here's what deism means. Here's what deism means. I'm just, I'm just, I'm saying this so you understand that the Enlightenment was part of the problem. Not any, it had nothing to do with any prosperity that we had for uh, 200 years here in this country. Nothing. It worked against, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's helping destroy what we have today. Deism is this idea that God equals the natural world. That God is nature. That there is no supernatural. It's that just, we know there's God. I mean, it's a, it's a twisting of Romans 1. Where Romans 1 basically teaches us that, you know, there's two things that everybody, I've taught this before, there's two things that everybody starts with. There's two things that everybody starts with. Everybody can see the creation. That's evidence of God. And then in Romans 2.15, everybody gets a conscience. God wrote the law in every man's heart. I don't care if you grew up in South America, you grew up in, in Texas, or wherever you grew. Everyone started with a conscience, and everybody can see the creation. So nobody has an excuse, the Bible says. But God is not just the creation. This is scientism. Right? This is scientism, this idea that science can explain everything. Science can explain everything because God is supernatural. His ways are higher than our ways. We cannot recreate the miracles of Jesus in the Bible through scientific experimentation because God is above 
his laws that he created. He's higher. His ways are literally higher. So this idea of deism is that God equals creation. That's all he is. There is no supernatural. The example that I've heard given that, that kind of fits deism is that God was a watchmaker. God was a watchmaker and he made this beautiful watch, which is this creation. He wound it up and he let it go. Meaning there is no supernatural. There is no revelation to the watch. You know what that means? There is no Bible. There is no intervention. Deism teaches that God does not intervene. He's a watchmaker. He made the watch. He wound it up and he stepped back. Does God intervene in this world? What is the main intervention that God did in this world? He sent the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem the world. I mean, talk about intervention. God does intervene. Deism teaches that there is no Jesus, folks. There's no prayer. There's no Bible. The Bible is Jesus, the Word of God. Right there we lose. This is kind of the idea that we watched this movie on a church movie night called Time Changer. My son loves it. And it's this idea, it was this idea, you say, what's the big deal, Pastor? They still believe in God, even though he's the creation, he doesn't intervene, there's no revelation, there's no Bible. Here's the problem. The whole premise of that movie was this argument. It was this argument of, What's the, what's the difference if we tell a child that he can't steal because it's wrong? Why can't we just tell him that? Why do we have to go up to that child and say, no, you can't steal. It's wrong because the Lord Jesus Christ said it's wrong. What's the difference? Why do we have to have the Lord Jesus Christ in there? That was the whole premise. But you know what that movie was teaching? It was teaching against the Enlightenment. Because the Enlightenment thought, like, natural law. See? The social contract. This is the writings of Locke and Rousseau and all these things that, but here's the problem, folks. Here's the problem. If there's, a no, if there's no authority, there's no authority. If there's no absolute truth, one person's truth is just as good as another person's truth. This is the problem. This is why you must teach that child that he cannot steal because the Lord Jesus Christ said so. Brother Trevor had a brilliant example on Friday night where he said, the, the couple that's living together, the couple that is living together, that is not married, but they, they are raising children together and they, they only are there for each other and they, they're monogamous to each other and, and they have children and they live together till, till, till they die. But then you have another couple over here that does exactly the same thing, but they're married. They're right, and they're wrong. Why? Because Jesus Christ said so. That's why. Because there is authority to the morality. If there is no word of God, if there is no intervention, there's no truth. Your truth is just as good as mine. Your ideas are just, what are we seeing today? This, the truth being twisted and just torn apart and just all these words being redefined. But the word that is misdefined the most that I want to talk about this morning is this word freedom. Is this word freedom. So another person, another guy asked on, on, on Friday night, like, how do I take the U.S.? How do I take the United States as a Bible-believing Christian right now? How do I take the United States? Do I say, do I go to bed and I say, God bless America? How do I take it? See, most conservatives need to learn the Bible. Most conservatives need to get saved and start reading the Bible if they want the answer. Because conservatives today are like, freedom, freedom. No, the definition of freedom today is the problem. That's the problem. So, I mean, how do I take the U.S. to answer that question um, to that young man at the church? Well, first of all, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful that I was born here. I'm never going to leave here. This is my country. I'm thankful for the the true freedom that we do have, the true freedom that we do have in this country, which basically it comes down to, you know, the freedom to preach the gospel. That's what it comes down to. I mean, the United States is still better than a lot of places. Look, you know, the funny thing is, though, you're starting to see this inversion where it's not really that much nicer in many ways. Wicked, godless countries have nicer cities than us. Wicked, godly countries have safer cities than us. Wicked, godless countries 
have, I, I'm sorry, I said godly, I said go, I meant godless. Wicked countries like China and Russia and all these other countries that they're not, they, they don't have freedom. They're, they don't even, that's not even really a thing there. They, they have more civilized societies than we do in many ways at this point. But for the Christian to preach, you know, for the freedom to preach door to door and the freedom to stand up from the pulpit and still preach the word of God, look, that's the sad thing is that the preachers stop preaching it when they had the freedom to do so. For the freedom to do that, I mean, I America is still the best. I think that America probably has the most saved people in the world. That's powerful. That's powerful when you look at when nations will be destroyed, you know, in Genesis. Genesis 19, you know, God says, if there's 50 there, I'm not going to destroy it. So look, the saved people, we're going to talk about that tonight, they're standing in the gap for this country. So I'll look, I'm thankful, and look, I'm pragmatic too. I'm pragmatic, so I'm thankful and I'm pragmatic. That's my view towards the United States. What do you mean by pragmatic? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, as a pragmatic person, I think they're pretty decent engines. I think they're pretty decent ideas. We, we talk about a lot of engines here. We like engines. We like, you know, there's some engines that have been made throughout the last 20 or 30 years that are just like, they're, they're above grade. They're, the, they're better than most engines that are built. We talk about these types of engines all the time, like the four liter Jeep like the 7.3 liter Ford diesel. Excellent engine, it just, it just runs forever. It just won't stop running. The, like pretty much any Toyota. But the Constitution, the, you know, but all engines wear out, I don't care how good they are. All engines are imperfect, I don't care how good they are. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they're good. They're good when it comes to trying to protect us from evil, wicked people. They're pretty good ideas. They're a good stopgap, I guess, is the way I look at it. But guess what, folks? The Constitution and the Bill of Rights didn't save us from the banks in 1913. They didn't save us from the Federal Reserve taking over our country in 1913. The Constitution didn't save us from that. The Bill of Rights didn't. Many men before 1930 tried to stop it. But eventually those men died, and the men that stopped, and then there was no one left to fight, and the banks took over. Mayor Rothschild said this, give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. Well, isn't that true? What gets us into all these wars that we're in now? It, it's, it's the money. It's the banks. I don't care what foreigner you talk to, everyone knows this. I talked to a guy from Nigeria a couple days ago, and we're just like going back and forth in the Uber, He's like, yeah, it's the money. He's a Muslim. And he's like, it's just the money. And I'm like, it's the money. And he's like, I know. And I'm like, everybody knows. Why is it happening? I told him if a Ukrainian and a Russian found themselves in a grocery store in Fresno, California, do you think they'd start rolling on the floor and beating each other to, to a pulp? Of course not. They'd probably get along. But because of the money and the banks and all this. But look, the Constitution didn't stop us from that. Not to go off, but just it didn't stop us from that. It didn't stop us from murdering 64 million unborn children in this country. The Constitution didn't stand in front of those children and save their lives. It didn't stop it. It didn't stop mass murder. But you know, people before 1900, they wouldn't even thought of such a thing. Yeah, you're starting to kind of get the answer, hopefully. It didn't stop the flood. Of, turn to Nahum chapter 3. Turn to Nahum chapter 3. It didn't stop the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It didn't stop this flood of perversion that we're seeing today. And that, you know what? And that we're exporting around the world. And this will be, this will be the downfall of us here. And it's happening in real time, if you're paying attention. We're trying to export all this perversion around the world. And this is what's happening to us. Look at Nahum chapter 3. Talk about God telling us, giving us a, a heads up on this. And he says, I will cast abominable filth upon thee. He's like, you turn against me, and I'm going to cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile. And look at this. I will set thee a gazing stock. People will look at you. You know, we're a laughing stock. We're a gazing stock to the world. As we try to export this stuff, all this, this perverted garbage to other nations in the world and tell them we're not going to give you money unless you include all this perverted stuff in your schools and all this stuff and we 
against you know, nations that want to keep, you know, biblical morality, you know, as their culture in their country. And we, you know what, they're, they're just like, they're like, it's disgusting, stay away from us. We're driving everybody away. And look, it's, there's going to be a war. There's going to be a war because they're all, they're all backing out. They don't want any part of this. They're just gazing at us going, that's disgusting. You know, I thought years ago, I, I thought years ago, I was like, maybe we should have codified the morality in the Constitution. You know, maybe we should have codified, you know, not just the limited government, but we should have codified. Maybe that would have bought us more time. But no, it's just a piece of paper. It can't stand up for itself. Evil can defeat a piece of paper. The New Mexico governor just yesterday or the day before suspended the Second Amendment. She's just like, I mean, it was like, you know, pro 2A. She's just like, yeah, no more. Emergency. It's an emergency. I mean, the, I didn't see the Bill of Rights stand up and punch her in the face or whatever, you know? I mean, it's just a piece of paper. Public health emergency. This is the reason for the rod of iron. This is the reason for the rod of iron. Turn to Romans chapter 7. See, the problem in America is a fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of the word freedom. Actually, turn to Proverbs I'll read 28, you turn to Romans chapter 7. Ultimately, the U.S. succeeded and prospered only because the people were with God. Only because the people believed God. Only because they believed the Bible. When the people leave God, Proverbs 28, verse 2 says this, For the transgression of the land are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge the state thereof shall be prolonged. The Bible is saying here, as a land transgresses, they will become less free. See, freedom is not the answer, it's the reward. And this is a universal truth. I don't care how much you love freedom, and you think you have the definition correct, as the land transgresses, we will get less and less and less free. It's what's going to happen. And it's the same in the Bible over and over and over and over again. I mean, will man learn? And the answer is no. Jesus is going to have to show him with a rod of iron. With a rod of iron. Are you there? Are you there? Because look, real freedom is prosperity in godliness. And that comes with private property and peace and all these different things. America has a freedom problem today. They don't know what it means. Look at Romans 7:14. The Bible says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You know what that means? Sin is bondage. It's not freedom. This is the problem with America today. And this is the problem that Jesus will fix in the millennial reign. Filth, perversion, unnaturalness, drunkenness, violence, fornication, theft of property. It's bondage. It is slavery. And people didn't stand up and say, no, you are not going to drag us into bondage with you. This is true individually, and it's true for a nation. It's true for you as a Christian. You're like, I'm saved. I can do whatever sin I want. You can. You're going to drive yourself into bondage. You're like, I'm saved. I'm saved. People look at us, and they're like, you're telling people that if they trust on the Lord Jesus Christ that there's nothing they could do. You know how many Catholics I've had tell me this? That there's nothing they could do to lose their salvation? You can't tell people that. They'll go crazy. No, they won't because they, they want to be free. They don't understand the Bible. Paul tells us over and over again, he's trying to explain to us in Romans, he's like, grace will abound. You go off and you follow the flesh and you just you continue to be carnal after you're saved. Grace will abound. It's like, but you will put yourself voluntarily back into bondage. Like, why would you do that? That's why, you know, someone who's saved and wants to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with their life, they're going to get this stuff out of their life. Because why? Because they want to be free. And they understand what freedom and bondage is. We have, we have lumped in sin in this country as freedom. Yep. And this is why Jesus needs a rod. Because when people start to do that in the millennial reign, he's going to break them in pieces. 
Sin is not freedom. It never has been. And many people, even during the millennial reign, will want this. They will want bondage. Jesus has the rod of iron. This is the answer this morning. Jesus has the rod of iron during the millennial reign to maintain freedom during the millennial reign. True freedom is not the answer for America, folks. And when I say true freedom, I mean the actual definition of freedom as we see in the millennial reign. True freedom is not the answer for America. True freedom is the result that America would get if we went back to the Word of God. If we started, instead of being a nation that is at this point in history where the fewest people in the country believe the Bible, instead, if we started turning back to God, if we repented as a nation, as Nineveh repented, and turned from our sins as a nation, look, nations need to turn from their sins. Individuals don't need to turn from their sins to be saved. But nations need to repent. And then we would get true freedom back in this country. But that's what we will have under the millennial reign of Christ. And the fact that people will desire this bondage, they'll desire the sin, they'll desire the violence, it always comes back, it always comes down to the violence. I don't care what kind of civilization or empire you have, as they turn from the Lord, it goes through all these wicked stages of sin and perversion. I mean, even a logical person, find me a nation and empire that has embraced sexual perversion like we're embracing today and has, has stood. It's always the end of that empire. You don't even need the Bible to know one. This shows you how stupid people are today. But when people try to embrace the sin and the violence and all of this during the millennial reign, that's why Jesus will have the rock on Show us how it's done. Stand up against it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.